Rwanda. All over the front pages, of course, today, the other interesting thing is that the Irish have said that they want to put police onto the border between the, the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland to stop illegal migrants from crossing that border. This is the border, of course, that they didn't want. So let's talk to Henry Bolton and to Ivan Sampson uh, right now. We're going to have a little debate about what is going on. Henry, first of all, to you. Welcome to both of you. Thank you very much for joining us this early in the morning. Um, Good morning. What do you make of the Irish plan to try and police the border that they didn't want? It's all a bit strange, isn't it? Yeah, it is a little strange, Mike. In a sense, they don't have much choice. They've got political pressures at home as well. Um, but I, I see in this, uh, although it's an almighty mess, I see in this an opportunity because, look, now, or until now, I think the European Union, the Irish, the French, were all thinking, that's fine, they're all piling over to, to the UK. The UK's left the European Union, that's all well and good. Nothing to do with us anymore, it's their problem. They chose this, they can have it. Right, now it's impacting on Ireland and the European Union. Fine. So this now should, could provide the traction for somebody with the sufficient leadership to step up to the plate and say, look, you don't want them in France, you don't want them in Ireland, we don't want them, the European Union doesn't want them. We know that if we, if we acknowledge it or not, we know that the vast majority of these people, even if they've come from regions where there is some sort of conflict, they are economic migrants. They're shopping around for the best deal that they can get. And we've got to deal with that together. And I think, actually, because we're in the middle of this, Rishi Sunak is in the ideal position to do that. The question then is, does he have the ability, the, the steel, the, the, the leadership to do it? Uh, I, I think that's we, we all doubt that very much. Uh, but it is an opportunity for him. So, I think so, yeah. What, Let's get uh, Ivan on the case here. Ivan, very good morning to you. I, I promise I won't be as horrible to you as Kevin O'Sullivan was last <laughs> night, but, you know, uh, Henry might be. We'll see how that goes. Has anything <laughs> changed since the last time you and I spoke? You know, we've now had one uh, person sent to Rwanda. He went because he wanted to go, took the 3,000 quid offer, uh, is going to be put up there for five years. Uh, presumably now we can say, well, clearly Rwanda is not a dangerous place to be sent because he went voluntarily and no lefty lawyers tried to stop him. Yeah, just clear up the issue about is Rwanda safe. That's not the issue. The issue, what the Supreme Court said was, the policy of refoulement is not lawful. So there's a risk for them that they'll be refooled elsewhere. That's what made it unlawful. And the second point was that Rwanda didn't have a system or the expertise to consider asylum application in a fair, fair manner. Now, Henry is going on about, we don't want them. We don't want them. Well, 60% of those people crossing the channel are accepted as genuine refugees. And I just remind Henry, we're members, we are signed up to the Refugee Convention and the European Convention on Human Rights. So when he says we don't want them, uh, who is he talking about? Is he talking about genuine asylum seekers? or he doesn't want anyone at all, well, whether they're genuine all right. well, or I'll not let, well, I'll let, well, I'll let him answer that, but what I would say before I let you answer that, Henry, is that 60% might be accepted in this country, but they're not accepted at that level in any other European country. Henry, I'll let you answer for yourself. Oh, yeah, I was going to make it exactly the same point. Uh, and in fact, you know, we, yesterday in the media, there was a chap who's been turned down in, in numerous places, um, but then still came to the UK in the hope of, of getting asylum here. Um, the other thing is, just because people are granted asylum does not mean that they, in, in, as far as I'm concerned, that they are actually deserving of it. We have got a government that is under huge pressure to get rid of the backlog. Now, that means shortcutting things. We know, and Ivan knows, that our, the Home Office, he said it, the Home Office is, is not fit for purpose. The people who are doing a lot of the assessments of these claims simply don't have the geographical knowledge or the knowledge of organised crime or the knowledge of the economic and security situation in the countries that these people are coming from to interrogate that process robustly. Of course I'm not saying that somebody who is fleeing for their life should not be given refuge. I am not saying that at all, underlined. I am saying that many of these people are able to game the system and as a result more than should be are being great gained asylum and that then skews the figures. I'm, I'm, I'm frankly sick and tired of hearing this argue, argument, well they all get granted asylum anyway so that proves that they're worthy no it doesn't it proves that we that even what ivan is saying that the home office process is not robust enough yeah 
I think that's absolutely right. I mean, it's a bit like saying, Ivan, isn't it, that, you know, because nobody gets prosecuted for shoplifting, it's not really illegal anymore. You know, you can use all, all sorts of statistical information to prove a point. But I think Henry makes a, a, a good point there. The fact is that uh, many, many people, as we know, who have been refused asylum, stay here, uh, try again, get refused again, stay here, try again, eventually get asylum for one reason or another because they figured out how to do it. In one case, of course, famously up in Newcastle, a guy decided to convert to Christianity, even though clearly nobody really believed that that was what he had done. So the system is faulty, isn't it? No, I don't agree with that. Look, 50 You don't agree with what? No, I don't agree the system is faulty. Of course it it's is. The no, the, it, no, it's the enforcement of the system is a problem. We have the law to remove those people that are not genuine asylum seekers. Fact. We don't do it. Yeah, we we have laws so to So that means the system's faulty, doesn't it? No, it's enforcement's faulty. It, it's actually the management of the system. We've th the laws are there, Mike. The laws are all there. But just a point on the um, civil servants' challenge to the Rwanda Act. Yes. We've got a lacuna. We've got a, a massive lacuna because the government... You have to explain what a lacuna is. Otherwise people... Well, there's a conflict of laws. There's right. a conflict of two laws. So okay. we, we've got... Um, we've got the... We're signed up to the Refugee Convention, Human Rights Convention, uh, the Human Rights Act since 1998. And what the Act did was disapply it. So we're signed up to an Act where they say, look, you know what? We, we won't even look at that for this particular problem we have. And also, although the judges have said the policy is unlawful, we say it is lawful. So we're going to erode scrutiny of the courts as well. Well, no. So well, not at all. No, I mean, even, even, even Dave Penman from the, from the FDA union accepts that they work to parliamentary sovereignty. And parliamentary sovereignty has created a law in this country which is the law of this country. And international law is overtaken by that. In any situation, well, parliamentary sovereignty creates the Human Rights Act. Yes, but, so yes, but that, that parliamentary section... sovereignty in this particular instance means that this is the can new I just law. Make a point? Which, well, you can, yeah, but you can't just the, keep the, making the points which are not going to be disputed. The Human Rights Act. It's a purposive approach when you when you look at laws. The purpose of the Human Rights Act was that subsequent parliaments wouldn't erode those fundamental human rights. We've got a bunch of scallywags. What about have. our human We've rights? Got no well, shame on. at all. What about my human <laughs> rights? And what about the human rights of people who live in Britain not to have a load of people landing on the beaches <laughs> thinking they can come and live here, get given free money and a free house for the rest of time? What about the human well, rights of people who live in that street? Henry. Right to love. Right to not to be tortured. If, right to if, free elections. Right to if, have if, married who I want. Right to have a free vote. Uh, Ivan. These are human rights. Not yeah, all right. Your... Well, like, 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 well uh, Henry Bolton has a human right to speak, so let him speak. <laughs> Henry, go on. Uh, look, I, I, I don't understand, uh, Ivan, why is it that you believe that Parliament, if Parliament is sovereign, which I believe it is, as the elected representatives of the people and therefore the sovereignty from the people, um, if uh, why can Parliament not provide an exception so it's the Human Rights Act. Are you saying that no matter what the circumstances, today, tomorrow, 20 years down the road, 50, 100 years down the road, no parliament can adjust its laws to deal with circumstances and risks that arise? Of course, it must be able to do that. It's got to have the agility to do that. What I, what I rather fear, Ivan, is that you're in the mindset, as the European Union is, because that's what they apply, of codified law and that is a problem because that you it's always been a problem we must exercise the agility to be able to meet and match uh, any risk any threat and this is a, a a risk of national security or well, public security it's a risk in terms of our housing it's a risk in terms of our economy it's a risk in terms of our, our public uh, utilities and services they are all being overburdened and we don't know who many of these people are, and we do know that many of them are economic migrants. Even if if we take your very, uh, I think, uh, very generous figures of saying that 60% of them should be given asylum, well, what about the 40% who shouldn't? And you're right about enforcement, but we're letting these people into the country. We've got a long process that enables them to stay here for many years whilst their their claims are being assessed all of this is broken 
So then I come back to the point, well, if it's all broken, the enforcement, the, the, the processing, the detention part of it, the, the whole thing is broken, then why is it that the one bit that's not is the 60% of asylum claims that are granted? Yes.